This is the complete reading of the second book of the Tao, The Teachings of Kuang Tzu, translated by Stephen Mitchell in 2010. Chapter 1 What is bestowed on us at birth is called human nature. The fulfillment of human nature is called the Tao. The cultivation of the Tao is the deepest form of learning. The Tao is the way things are, which you can't depart from even for one instant. If you could depart from it, it wouldn't be the Tao. Therefore the Master looks into her own heart and respects what is unseen and unheard. Nothing is more manifest than the hidden nothing is more obvious than the unseen. Therefore the Master pays attention to what is happening within her innermost self. We think that we know what human nature is, but what if our most cherished assumptions are wrong? What if all suffering is the result of confused thoughts? That would change our paradigm a bit. We're born into the open, into the vast mind empty of meaning. Beyond thought, beyond things, reality just is. Human nature doesn't need to be fulfilled, nor do we need to cultivate what is already perfect. Once we recognize this, we return to the origin of all things. There is never a movement toward or away. We remain where we have always been, but now we know it, as if for the first time. Departing from the Tao can happen only in the mind it's an illusion that becomes our reality. Though we actually live in what is, we think ourselves into what isn't. Though every apparent detour is the path, we get lost in our imagined wanderings. That's why, if we're interested in freedom, there is nothing sweeter than to cultivate, cultivate to get down, with trowel and hoe, into the thought-rich soil of the mind. It's all about paying attention to what is happening within our innermost self, until the unseen, the unquestioned, is as obvious as the seen. When the mind is free of its thoughts, it becomes its own fulfillment. Chapter 2 Before sorrow, anger, longing, or fear have arisen, you are in the center. When these emotions appear, and you know how to see through them, you are in harmony. That center is the root of the universe, that harmony is the Tao, which reaches out to all things. Once you find the center and achieve harmony, heaven and earth take their proper places and all things are fully nourished. This chapter is about saving the world. You save the world when you save yourself. There's no one else you can save returning to the center is thus an act of infinite kindness. There's nothing wrong with sorrow, anger, longing, or fear a painful emotion is just a signal that you've left the center. When you are at peace, everything is at peace. What seemed like cacophony becomes the music of the spheres a sweet for unaccompanied mind. Living in harmony with the way things are, the mind finds its center everywhere, its circumference nowhere. The part becomes the whole what is becomes what should be. Heaven takes its proper, its only place on earth. Chapter 3 The great Tao cannot be named, Great discernment cannot be seen, great benevolence is not gentle, great modesty is not meek, great courage is not aggressive. When you truly understand the Tao that cannot be named, you become rooted in not knowing. This is called inner radiance add to it, it is never full take from it, it is never depleted. Who can tell where it comes from? It is the inexhaustible treasury. Oh, who named it the Tao in the first place? I would like to talk to that fellow. I'd like to give him a piece of my mind. The Tao, the way. Imagine naming the unnameable. This may have seemed like a clever idea at the time, but it led to endless complications. Before long, people were searching everywhere for the way. Intellectuals began to wear themselves out debating whether it existed or not, or whether perhaps it both existed and didn't exist, or whether indeed it neither existed nor didn't exist. Scholars wrote tomes, with characters brushed in the blackest of ink to prove that the way goes this way or that. Moralists determined what is on the way and what is off, discerning, down to the minutest particulars, exactly what we must do never to stray from the way. Thus Taoism was born. But every ism is a wasm. It's already old news and exoskeleton from which the living truth has moved on. The Tao that cannot be named is the intelligence of the universe whatever is happening right now. The mind that realizes this is the don't-know mind, which is open to all possibilities because it doesn't believe its own thoughts. What more is there to say? Except that there's a radiance about people who have settled into the depths of not knowing. You can see it in their eyes. 
it doesn't depend on what happens or doesn't happen. They have found the inexhaustible treasure in the most obvious place of all. Chapter 4 When we exhaust our minds by clinging to a particular side of reality without realizing the underlying oneness, it's called three in the morning. What does that mean? A monkey trainer handing out acorns said, each of you will get three in the morning and four in the afternoon. The monkeys were outraged. So he said, all right, then you'll get four in the morning and three in the afternoon. The monkeys were delighted. Nothing essential had changed, yet one statement produced anger and the other joy. The trainer simply knew how to adapt to reality and he lost nothing by it. Thus the master uses his skill to harmonize with both sides and rests in the Tao, which makes all things equal. This is called walking on two paths at once. The whole human condition is present in this tricky little tale, which would be sad if it weren't so ridiculous. Although from the standpoint of the monkeys it's about the power of righteous indignation, from the standpoint of the monkey trainer, behind the scenes, it's about skillful management. You have to admire his one-two punch, he's both bad cop and good cop. But what is the trainer training the monkeys in, anyway? Discernment? If so, he's being made a monkey of. Whenever we cling to a particular side of reality, it's we who are the monkeys, losing ourselves in outrage or partial delight. If we look more carefully, though, we can see that reality has only one side, like a Mobius strip. Stars or raindrops, acorns or ashes, apparent blessings, apparent disasters when the mind is clear, each is an occasion for rejoicing. That's what discernment is about. Once our mind monkeys are fully trained, it's all good. In the mathematics of mental peace, three equals four, one equals zero. Adapting to reality means recognizing that nothing underlies or overlays it. The master can travel on two paths at once, like a photon, because his mind is free. He's subatomic and supererogatory. He knows that all ways are the way and that ultimately he is neither coming nor going. Chapter 5 the ancient masters saw deeply. How deep was their insight? They realized that nothing exists. This is perfect understanding. Those at the next stage thought that things existed but saw no boundaries between them. Next came those who saw boundaries but didn't judge things as good or bad. When judgments arose, understanding was damaged when understanding was damaged, preferences became ingrained, but is there really such a thing as damage or wholeness? The master understands that there is nothing to understand. The ancient masters saw deeply indeed. They realized that since nothing lasts longer than the untraceable instant, nothing ultimately exists. They also realized that nothing is something and that the opposite of a profound truth is another profound truth. Nothing exists. Something exists. All Cretans are liars, said the Cretan. It's better to keep your mouth shut. Still, these old fellows were onto something. If nothing exists as we know it, if time and space are intellectual categories, there's nothing we can actually grasp, to arrange or disarrange. This leaves us free. It leaves us at play in the cosmic theater of the mind. All the world's a stage, and we are the non-actors. Can life be as simple as that? It went downhill from there, to the next stage, then the next. Boundaries, preferences, attachments, and before we knew it, our days filled up with screaming babies, mortgage payments, nasty messages in the mailbox. Damage and wholeness are in the eyes of the beholder, of course. If you're a child, there's nothing more fun than going downhill. A tragedy is a comedy misunderstood. Once you realize what you are, there's nothing left but gratitude and laughter. Chapter 6 Everything can be seen as a this everything can be seen as a that. That, that depends on the this, the, this mirrors the that. One follows from the other, each is inseparable from both. You can't have right without wrong. Life without death, the true without the false. The master is not trapped in opposites. His, this is also a that. He sees that life becomes death and death becomes life. That right has a kernel of wrong within it and wrong a kernel of right. That the true turns into the false and the false into the true. He understands that nothing is absolute that since every point of view depends on the viewer, affirmation and denial are equally beside the point. The place where the this and the 
that are not opposed to each other is called the pivot of the tau. When we find this pivot, we find ourselves at the center of the circle. And here we sit, serene. While yes and no keep chasing each other around the circumference, endlessly. Mind can only create the qualities of good and bad by comparing. Remove the comparison, and there go the qualities. What remains is the pure, unknown, ungraspable object, ungraspable subject, and the clear light of awareness streaming through. The pivot of the Tao is the mind free of its thoughts. It doesn't believe that this is a this or that that is a that. Let yes and no sprint around the circumference toward a finish line that doesn't exist. How can they stop trying to win the argument of life until you stop? When you do, you realize that you were the only one running. Yes was you, no was you. The whole circumference, with its colored banners, its pom-pom girls and frenzied crowds that was you as well. At the center, the eyes open and again, it's the sweet morning of the world. There's nothing here to limit you, no one here to draw a circumference. In fact, there's no one here, not even you. Chapter 7 Nothing in the world is bigger than the tip of an autumn hair, and Mount Everest is tiny. No one in the world has lived longer than a stillborn child, and Methuselah died young. The universe came into being the moment that I was born, and all things are one with me. Since all things are one, how can I put that into words? But since I just said they are one, how can my words mean nothing? The one plus my words make two and the two plus the one make three. If we continue in this way, even the greatest mathematician couldn't calculate where it will end. If by moving from non-being to being we get to three, what happens when we move from being to being? It's better just to leave things alone. There are paradoxes born of wit and paradoxes born of insight. No thought is true, but some thoughts are so much truer than the ones we're used to that they seem absurd at first glance. It's all a question of perspective. Down at the level of the micro, there is no macro. If you get small enough, you see that the world isn't solid and that uncertainty is the only thing that's certain, perhaps. Thus, everything the electron meets is electronal. Ditto a galaxy, its consciousness, if it has one, is as little aware of a planet as you are of a corpuscle. We can't stand outside the system and point to what's real, because what's real is defined by the system. This is relativity writ large. The fastest thing in the universe isn't light, it's mind. All things may be one with me, but am I one with them? That's the issue. And once I am one, what then? Even the one is excessive for anyone who wants to be meticulous. Look where it leads, after all to two, to three, to infinity, to an infinity of infinities and beyond always the unattainable, unassuageable beyond. Of course the nothing is out of the question as well since there's already a word for it. Not one, not nothing. This leaves you in an ideal position speechless, delighted, and ready to say the most nonsensical things, if only they make sense. Eight. How do I know that loving life isn't simply a delusion? How do I know that when we're afraid of death we aren't like someone who left home as a young child and has forgotten the way back? How do I know that the dead aren't so happy that they wonder why they once clung to life? You may dream that you're at a banquet and wake up to find yourself miserable. You may dream that you're sobbing your heart out and wake up to find yourself at ease. How, in the middle of a dream, can you know that you're actually dreaming? In the middle of a dream, you may even try to interpret the dream only after you wake up, do you realize that you were dreaming? Someday there will be a great awakening when we know that all this was one big dream. And when I say that we're dreaming, of course I am dreaming too. How do I know? Well, I don't. So that settles that. But loving life isn't a problem. Preferring life to death, that's what causes the confusion. It could be if there were such a thing as departing that death is the return to a presence the wandering mind has long forgotten. It could be if there were such a thing as separate beings that the dead look upon our attachment to life like fond grandparents watching a teenager's first tumultuous love affair. It could be, in fact, that the dead are nothing but their own delight there if there were such a thing as space where they know even as they are known. We are close to waking up when we dream that we are dreaming. All the imagined oops and downs, the hubbub and reversals of fortune, are what most people call life. 
But before and after, at the point where the end meets its beginning, there is only what has woken up from the cycle of waking, dreaming, and dreamless sleep. As for a great awakening dream on, when do you think that that someday will come, after all? Isn't it enough just to open your eyes, feel the pillow beneath your head, and see the hands of the alarm clock pointing to this very moment, as if there were such a thing as time? 9. Chuang Tzu dreamt that he was a butterfly, fluttering here and there, carefree, unaware of a Chuang Tzu. Then he woke up, and there he was again Chuang Tzu, beyond a doubt. But was he Chuang Tzu who had dreamt that he was a butterfly, or a butterfly now dreaming that he was Chuang Tzu? There must be some difference between Chuang Tzu and a butterfly. This is called the transformation of things. The most famous dream in human history. You may feel that, as with Zeno's paradoxes, there is something specious going on here, if only you could put your finger on it. But the more closely you examine the story, the more penetrating Chuang Tzu's question becomes. He's the anti-serpent in the garden, tempting you to take one little bite from the tree of life. He's Alice's caterpillar, puffing on his hookah and asking, who are you? In fact, with time running backward as in a Feynman diagram, Alice's caterpillar could well have metamorphosed into Chuang Tzu's butterfly, just to prove a point. You may be recalling that psyche. The Greek word for soul can also mean butterfly, but let's leave the Greeks out of this. Chuang Tzu is definitely Chinese, he thinks. His butterfly is not a metamorphosis, not a metaphor, it's just a butterfly. Just, how can we know what depths of joy lie hidden within that pinpoint of a brain? The whole world contained in a garden, in a single flower, all time contained in a summer's day, and life one all-embracing multi-orgasmic fragrance. And who knows what a butterfly might dream of? Of an ancient Chinese philosopher, perhaps, or of a 19th century Oxford don who was enchanted by little girls. This particular butterfly woke up as Shuang Tzu, or was it Shuang Tzu who woke up as himself? There he was again, beyond a doubt, beyond a doubt. Ha! Things change before our very eyes, whether our eyes are open or shut. A butterfly becomes a man, a man becomes a question mark, a question mark becomes a winged creature, carefree, doing whatever it likes. Thus identity melts away, and we are left with something more valuable, a self, a non-self that includes it all. 10. There was a beginning of time. There was a time before the beginning of time. There was a time before the time before the beginning of time. There is being. If there is being, there must be non-being. If there is non-being, there must have been a time when even non-being didn't exist. Suddenly there was non-being. But can non-being really exist? and can being not exist. I just said something, but did what I just said really say anything or not? The mind loves to play its little games about time. It visualizes time as space, it fills in the blanks, it sees a before and an after, it befores the before, afters the after, befores the after, afters the before, and that's just the beginning. By the time it has finished articulating futures and pasts, it is bound up in its own complications, a ball of perplexity, waiting for the coup de grace. How thorough Xuan Tzu is in deconstructing himself. He delights in being hoist with his own petard. He's like the cartoon character sitting out on a limb, backward, and sawing it away except that he knows perfectly well what will happen. His questions are more than Socratic. They cut to the bone. Here's the open secret, there is no beginning of time, only a beginning of thought. It arises from the I, the subtlest thought of all, which splits reality down the middle, creating this and that, inner and outer, and all the other mirrored zeros and ones that make up this apparent universe. Then, suddenly, one fine day, mind realizes that it knows nothing, that it is nothing, and sets itself free. Being, non-being, give me a break. 10. There was a beginning of time. There was a time before the beginning of time. There was a time before the time before the beginning of time. There is being. If there is being, there must be non-being. If there is non-being, there must have been a time when even non-being didn't exist. Suddenly there was non-being. But can non-being really exist? And can being not exist? I just said something. But did what I just said really say anything or not? 
The mind loves to play its little games about time. It visualizes time as space, it fills in the blanks, it sees a before and an after, it befores the before, afters the after, befores the after, afters the before, and that's just the beginning. By the time it has finished articulating futures and pasts, it is bound up in its own complications, a ball of perplexity, waiting for the coup de grace. How thorough Shuang Tzu is in deconstructing himself. He delights in being hoist with his own petard. He's like the cartoon character, sitting out on a limb, backward, and sawing it away, except that he knows perfectly well what will happen. His questions are more than Socratic. They cut to the bone. Here's the open secret there is no beginning of time, only a beginning of thought. It arises from the I, the subtlest thought of all, which splits reality down the middle, creating this and that, inner and outer, and all the other mirrored zeros and ones that make up this apparent universe. Then suddenly, one fine day, mind realizes that it knows nothing, that it is nothing, and sets itself free. Being? Non-being? Give me a break. 11. The master doesn't aim for success, doesn't avoid failure, doesn't act with a motive, doesn't try to follow the Tao. She speaks when she is silent, says nothing when she speaks, and remains pure amid the world's dust and grime. The master soars past the sun and moon, tucks the universe under her arm, and is one with the ten thousand things. She lets the confused stay confused if that is what they want, and is always available to those with a passion for the truth. In the welter of opinions, she is content with not knowing. She makes distinctions but doesn't take them seriously. She sees the world constantly breaking apart and stays centered in the whole. She sees the world endlessly changing and never wants it to be different from what it is. There's nothing special about the master. She doesn't know any secrets and she doesn't live in some state of exalted consciousness. She's just like you, except that she no longer believes her own thoughts. When I attained unexcelled perfect enlightenment, the Buddha said, there was nothing that I attained. The mind at peace with itself needs only what it has, wants only what it is. 12. The Tao penetrates into every last corner of the universe. Because it is deep and wide and extends its power everywhere, it transcends all things. Because it transcends all things, it is at the heart of all things. It shows itself without being seen, creates without doing, fulfills without an intention. It obeys only its own law, thus its creations are infinite. In this it is like heaven and earth. Heaven is a bright emptiness, but in its measureless extent it contains the sun, moon, planets and the uncountable stars, and through it all things are illumined. Earth is a heap of soil, but in its width and depth it holds up the great mountains, the rivers, lakes and seas, trees, plants, animals, birds, fish, and the monsters of the deep all life in its manifold splendor. The Tao claims nothing for itself, thus it contains all things. We love the nature of things, even when we don't understand it. Who doesn't take pleasure in light, so married to vision before any eyes existed? Who doesn't think that light is beautiful, whatever it happens to shine on? We're instinctively attracted to what is all-embracing and all-allowing. We can oppose it only if we construe it as something it's not. The nature of things can't help but be our own nature as well. What we love in the world is what we discover in ourselves. The infinite inclusiveness of heaven, the unshakable support of earth, how could we notice them if they weren't qualities of our noticing mind? Whatever the self describes, describes the self. 13. Things are the way they are because we think they're that way, good or bad. Acceptable or unacceptable, they conform to the way we see them. Originally, in themselves, all things are good and acceptable. That is why all things a blade of grass or a hundred-foot pine, a leper or a legendary beauty, a national hero or a traitor are equal in the Tao. None is more important or more valued than any other. Their difference is their completeness. Only the person of true vision can recognize them as equal. He sees past his own judgments, doesn't think more or less and accepts without even trying to. This is called honoring the Tao. There is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so this one liberating truth can be said in a hundred ways. Each goes to the root of the matter. What happens when we realize that the world appears according to our perception of it? 
For one thing, we don't take our judgment so seriously. The judging eye begins to unravel. Eventually, we discover that everything exists in itself, beyond comparison, beyond judgments, as it did for God on the evening of the sixth day behold, it is very good. When we look at creatures from this point of vision, it's easy to see that a blade of grass is as important as a pine tree, a minnow is valued as a whale. Size and complexity have nothing to do with it. Evolution doesn't mean progress, which is more conscious, the butterfly or the flower. The master sees that we're all doing the best we can with what we've been given. Realizing this, he doesn't expect anything of anyone. Thus, as he honors himself, he naturally honors the Tao. 14. Prince Wen Hui's cook, Ting, was cutting up an ox. Every touch of his hand, every ripple of his shoulders, every step of his feet, every thrust of his knees, every cut of his knife, was in perfect harmony, like the dance of the mulberry grove, like the chords of the lynx head music. Well done, said the prince. How did you gain such skill? Putting down his knife, Ting said, I follow the Tao, your highness, which goes beyond all skills. When I first began cutting up oxen, all I could see was the ox. After three years I had learned to look beyond the ox. Nowadays I see with my whole being, not with my eyes. I sense the natural lines. And my knife slides through by itself, never touching a joint, much less a bone. A good cook changes knives once a year he cuts. An ordinary cook changes knives once a month he hacks. This knife of mine has lasted for 19 years. It has cut up thousands of oxen, but its blade is as sharp as if it were new. Between the joints there are spaces. And the blade has no thickness. Having no thickness, it slips right through. There's more than enough room for it. And when I come to a difficult part, I slow down, I focus my attention. I barely move. The knife finds its way. Until suddenly the flesh falls apart on its own. I stand there and let the joy of the work fill me. Then I wipe the blade clean and put it away. Bravo, cried the prince. From the words of this cook I have learned how to live my life. In his rules for right livelihood, the Buddha prescribed trafficking in meat and in weapons, slaves, intoxicants, and poison. Clearly he never imagined someone like Prince Wenhuai's cook and artist of ox flesh, a saint of the bloody carcass. So much for rules. This just shows that nothing in life can be categorized or excluded. The whole world is our palate. Ting, it must be said, was a man of supreme integrity who trusted what is and needed no one's appreciation. For decades he had been putting on his one-man show for an audience of zero no one was watching, not even he. The glorious harmony of motion and intention simply happened without him. How can we know the dancer from the dance? In the practice of butchery, he had learned how to step aside and let his body do the thinking. He followed the Tao into a world of unadulterated sensation, an Eden of the don't-know mind. The vast universe, with its myriad chiliocosms within chiliocosms, became a single knife blade gliding through empty space. What did it matter that his material was slaughtered oxen rather than sounds or colors or words? Nothing remained but the pure joy of the work. And let's not forget the admirable Wen Huai. Instead of being caught up in princely pursuits like governing, hunting, or dallying with his concubines, there he was in the kitchen, taking exquisite notice of the lowly, which turned out to contain the supreme. When the student is ready, the teacher appears. 15. The ancient masters slept without dreaming and woke up without concerns. Their food was spare and simple. Their breath went deep. They didn't hold on to life and they faced death free of concepts, emerging without desire, going back without resistance. They never forgot their beginning, they didn't trouble their minds searching for what their end was. They received life as a gift and handed it back gratefully. Minds supple, faces serene, in a crisis cool as autumn, in relationships warm as spring. They were balanced, throughout the four seasons, and in harmony with the Tao. There was no limit to their freedom. The ancient masters had pared themselves down to the essential. They woke up, they ate, they worked, they made love, they raised their families, all the while unseduced by any thoughts that arose. This gave their lives a sense of spaciousness. They always had enough time to do what wanted to be done. 
They moved through each day as alert and unhurried as animals in the wild. How could they forget their beginning? That's where they were constantly centered, in the moment before a thought. They had returned to the primordial mind hovering overing over its own abyss, objectless, serene. No wonder their nights were dreamless and their skies full of stars. Gratitude makes no distinctions, it precedes its occasion. It is the magic well that never runs dry, the still waters where you kneel and see your own face, more beautiful than you could have imagined. You have heard of flying with wings, but can you fly without wings? You have heard of the knowledge that knows, but can you practice the knowledge that doesn't know? Consider a window it is just a hole in the wall, but because of it the whole room is filled with light. Thus, when the mind is open and free of its own thoughts, life unfolds effortlessly, and the whole world is filled with light. Wisdom is not a something to grasp or to have. When you discover the extent of your own ignorance, it's like a revelation. You mean that nothing I believe is true, suddenly a window appears in the hermetic chamber. A little openness becomes available. A little humility. Eventually you realize that there's nowhere the light doesn't penetrate, nowhere the non-wings can't fly. Birth and death, profit and loss, success and failure, health and sickness, these qualities are the world in its constant transformations. Day in and day out, they vanish into each other before our very eyes, and we don't know where they come from. The master maintains his balance whichever opposite he enters. He lets things go through their changes and stays focused on what is real. He is like the ocean though there are waves on its surface. In its depths there is perfect calm. Where can they come from, these book-ended qualities, but the projecting mind? The master is born, he dies, he makes money, he loses money, people love him. They don't, he has the flu, he's better. Amid the transformations of the apparent world, his mind simply observes, curious what will come next, knowing that when we try to grasp anything, it vanishes before our very eyes as do our very eyes. All this ungraspability is cause for rejoicing. It's the greatest show on earth mind realizing its own nature. There's nothing there, and the nothing is beautiful. So, of course, the master moves through his life with no problems, saying his yeses and noes with equal amusement, simultaneously waving hello, goodbye. Step beyond yourself. Step beyond the whole world. Step beyond all existence. When you penetrate that far, you will shine with the original brightness. You will realize that you are alone in the vast universe and that all things are nothing but you. You will slow off past and present and will enter the place where there is neither being nor non-being. The master remains peaceful in the midst of continual change. There is nothing that can disturb her, nothing that she finds unacceptable. She welcomes all beings, watches as they come and go, and stays rooted in what is real. This chapter is an accurate description of what happens when body and mind drop away. There is no way to describe the beauty of someone who has penetrated that far. Hui Tzu said to Chuang Tzu, Do you see that big tree by the roadside? Its trunk is so gnarled and knotted that no one could cut a straight board from it. Its branches are so twisted that no one can even measure them. There it stands. And no carpenter bothers to look at it. Your teaching is like that big and useless. That's why everyone ignores it. Chuang Tu said, Have you ever seen a wild cat stalking its prey? It crouches and waits. It leaps high and low, this way and that, until finally it gets caught in a trap and dies. Or what about a yak? It's as huge as a thundercloud, but it can't catch mice. As for the tree, why don't you plant it in the village of nothingness so you can stroll underneath it or take a nap in its shade? No axe will ever shorten its life. If it's useless, nothing can harm it. Chuang Tzu and Huai Tzu, Gilgamesh and Enkidu, Don Quixote and Sancho Panza, Laurel and Hardy, the classic combinations flint and steel. The line between friend, sidekick, and stooge is fuzzy at best, and it's not glamorous to be the beta male, but without beta, there's no alpha, no act. Keep the ball in play. That's all we ask. I hear Hui Tzu, Tzu attacks what he sees as a teaching. A teaching. Don't make me laugh. He's like a mosquito biting an iron bull. His criticism is entirely correct, but it's beside the point. Chuang Tuzu, however, has already completed his own demolition job. No defense is necessary because there's nothing left to attack. Like an Aikido master, he just steps aside 
and lets Huai Tzu's own momentum do the trick. He's here, he's there, he's everywhere, conjuring up wildcats, yaks, villages, nothingness, and suddenly he's back in the spotlight, pulling a red silk handkerchief out of the nose of that elegantly dressed woman in the front row. We love to see the sage get the best of it, coming to his conclusion like a tonic chord. How can it matter if he's useful or not? He is planted in his own integrity, and there he stands, gnarled and knotted, perfectly at ease with himself, his roots deep in earth, his branches held up to let the light in. The ancient masters didn't worry about the future and didn't regret the past. When they made a mistake, they corrected it and moved on when they achieved something, they didn't stop to take credit. They scaled the heights, never dizzy plumbed the depths, unafraid. Wherever they went in the world, they were at home. They realized that the less they knew, the more they understood. Thus they embodied the Tao. How cleanly the master lives, how close to the bone. It's total transparency what you see is what you get. Since she understands that alternative pasts are only thoughts, she knows that ultimately there are no mistakes in the universe. What happened is what should have happened, there's no other possibility. This insight allows her to confront her own mistakes as soon as they're pointed out. Because they're not personal, she can take full responsibility, correct them, and move on. There's no mental residue, no muss, no fuss. Nor does she stop to take credit for her achievements. Taking credit would never even occur to her. As if the achievement weren't its own reward. As if, in the freedom of not knowing, anything were required but the next step. The master treads lightly on the earth. Life is not serious for him, and death is not serious. Even if the whole world collapsed, it would not disturb him. He realizes what is essential. He has returned to the source. The more we move beyond our ideas about life and death, the more open we are to life. This radical ignorance is not a path to wisdom, it is wisdom itself. There's a current that is deeper than we are. It will carry us off whether we want it to or not. When we resist it, we suffer. Only when we let it take us can we begin to sense its intelligence. The master knows how to die, because he knows how to deal with the everyday losses that form the texture of our life. He deals with them by understanding that loss is just a concept. He looks into the abyss as into the eyes of the beloved. He knows nothing about death. He knows everything he needs to know about dying. We take on a human body and delight in what we take on, and every change. In this constantly changing form is an opportunity for rejoicing. The infinite possibilities of the human. Thus the master wanders at ease in a world where nothing is unwelcome. She delights in sickness and in health. She delights in an early death. She delights in old age. She delights in old age. She delights in the beginning. She delights in the middle and the end. No experience can happen that she would exclude or reject. In this she is like the Tao. That is why she can serve as a perfect example for others. Who is the you that takes on a human body? Is it the same you that's left after the body dies? Is anything left? Does it matter? The master's delight in the never-ending changes of body and world is a remarkable thing. Who would have thought that the mind could be so supple? All things flow the sun is new every day it is in change that we find rest. That's why the master wanders at ease in a world where no experience is excluded or rejected. She knows that the way in and the way out are one and the same. Sickness or health once the mind has been weaned from comparisons, poverty or riches, a ripe old age, an early death, the beginning. The middle, the end are equal. She's in love with what is, whatever form it may take. 23. Master Su, Master Yu, Master Li, and Master Lai were talking. Whoever can see non-being as his head, life as his back, and death as his butt, whoever knows that existence and non-existence are one body that someone we can be friends with. The four men looked at one another and smiled. Then Master Yu got sick. Master Su went to visit him. How are you, he said. Master Yu said, amazing. Look at how the Creator has bent me out of shape. My back is so curved that my intestines are on top of me. My chin digs into my belly button, my shoulders arch over my head, and my neck bones point to the sky. Yet he seemed peaceful and unconcerned. Hobbling over to the well, he looked in and said, My, my, 
how totally he has bent me out of shape. Are you discouraged? asked Master Sisu. Not at all, Master, you said. Why should I be? If things go on like this, maybe he'll change my left arm into a rooster, and I'll announce the dawn. Maybe he'll change my right arm into a crossbow, and I'll shoot a duck for dinner. Or maybe he'll change my buttocks into wheels. And with my spirit for a horse, I'll climb up into myself and go for a ride. I won't ever need a wagon again. I received life when the time came, and I'll give it back when the time comes. Anyone who understands the proper order of things that everything happens at exactly the right time will be untouched by sorrow or joy. In ancient times this was called original freedom when you argue with reality. You lose. It has always been this way. That's why I have no complaint whatsoever. These four old Chinese sages, who have met in the intimacy of realization, are like the men whom Yeats saw carved in lapis lazuli, climbing toward a little halfway house sweetened by plum or cherry branch. Where are Shuang Tzu's men in a garden? In a tea shop, the setting doesn't matter. Wherever it is, whether flowers surround them or falling leaves, I delight to imagine them seated there, knowing themselves to the core, saying only what is essential, and smiling in appreciation of the emptiness at the heart of things. End of Act 1 Act 2 is the answer to Job. Perhaps 20 years have gone by or 20 days. Master Yu is afflicted with a neuromuscular syndrome that has bent him over like a paper clip. Afflicted? No presented graced. He relates his symptoms with the aplomb of a pathologist teaching a case study, a connoisseur describing a masterpiece. No wonder he's so kind to himself. He had no preconceptions. He doesn't take the disease personally. People think that detachment must be a cold, humorless business. But Master Yu couldn't be more witty or engaging. Will his left arm turn into a rooster, his right arm a crossbow, his buttocks the wheels of a chariot? Anything can happen. After all, in this world of perpetual transformation, and he trusts that it will all be turned to good use. His amused segue into the surreal is a portrait of the mind at ease with itself. To conclude the dialogue, we're given a statement of what the masters are masters of. It's as if the smiles of the four old men have been transubstantiated into words. Original freedom the epitome of imperturbability. The gaiety of the mind that cannot be upset by anything that happens because at last it has met itself with understanding. 24. To find the Tao, there is nowhere you need to search. If it is not inside you, it is not the Tao. The Book of Songs says, When you make the handle of an axe by cutting wood with an axe, the model is near at hand. Thus, in dealing with people, you already have the perfect model of behavior inside you. Just act with integrity, according to your true nature. Don't do to others what you wouldn't want done to you. We talk of inside and outside, but it's as impossible to locate the Tao in the mind as in the world. Anything here or there isn't it. Can your eyes see themselves? When the answer searches for the answer, what can it ever find? That's why even the most golden rules of behavior don't work, if they're only rules. What is genuine has no models or rules. It's spontaneous, self-generating, free. Nothing can stand against it. It doesn't depend on motivation and isn't concerned with effect. It just wants to be itself, to express itself, to give itself utterly away. Its nature is kindness, but there's nothing moral about it. In dealing with people, you're always dealing with yourself. The apparent other is you in disguise, the mirrored impulse, the reflection of your own mind, brilliant or confused. Unkindness to the other is literally unkindness to you. When you realize this, you naturally stop hurting yourself. And in the end, you come full circle, where zero deg equals 360 deg and selfishness is an act of pure love. 25. When speaking to people, you must use words to explain that reality is beyond words. You must point to non-being through being and describe the whole through names for the separate parts. Show them that naming separates, and that each thing isn't really itself. But don't use a finger directly to show that it's not a finger use a non-finger, and they'll see that a finger isn't a finger. Don't use a horse directly to show that it's not a horse use a non-horse, and they'll see that a horse and they'll see that a horse isn't a horse. Heaven and earth are one finger the ten thousand things are one horse. 
When speaking to a master, you don't need to use words. You can sit around at a tea shop, for example, and not say anything to each other for hours. A smile is enough. A sip of tea is enough. When speaking to other people, you can still say everything with a smile or a sip of tea. But if you want to be understood, a skillful relationship with words is important, since reality is beyond words. Though ultimately all you can do is point. Not this, not that. An ancient Chinese logician explained that, because the word horse is colorblind, a white horse is not a horse for that matter, a horse is not a horse, it may be a four-legged animal that neighs, but it is not separate from the rest of non-horsical reality. If anything, it is reality horsing or reality being horsed, I realize that this is getting out of hand. Words are like that. Just when you try to get really serious, words refuse to behave. They just keep horsing around. So do your best. Keep smiling. Keep sipping. Know from the start that no one will understand. If you come upon a non-finger, as if that were possible, point it in the right direction. If you come upon a non-horse, lead it to water but don't expect it to drink. The master achieves success, yet he never does a thing. His example penetrates the whole world, yet no one depends upon him. People don't see him as a leader since he lets them find their own way. He stands upon what is fathomless and walks where no path exists. One of the wonders of what people refer to as spiritual practice, it can also be called sanity, is that life gets progressively easier. The bumps and jerks, the fumbles and false starts of the apprentice years smooth out until clarity becomes second nature. Effort is a thing of the past. You're no longer caught in the delusion of making things happen. Success is whatever is happening right now, and it has no opposite. Someone once asked a Zen master, what is the essence of wisdom the Zen master said, when spring comes, the grass grows by itself. The great masters left no precepts, no doctrines, no rules, no traditions, and their words self-destruct upon impact. They had no disciples, because there was nothing to bequeath. They were transparent to their own benevolence and too kind to offer help. Like the Cheshire cat, they had vanished down to their smile. Penumbra said to Shadow, when the towel moves, you move when it stops, you stop. Don't you find it depressing to have no power of your own? Shadow said, on the contrary. With no decisions to make, my mind is always at ease. All I have to do is follow. You can't imagine how much freedom there is in just going along for the ride. Penumbra said, but how can you know that its decisions are right? Where do you find your trust? Shadow said, whether I trust it or not, whether or not its decisions are right when it moves, I move, so I might as well trust it. Darkness is as good a metaphor for spiritual maturity as light is. People talk about enlightenment, and that describes one facet of the intricate jewel. But you could just as accurately call it endarkment. We plunge into utter blackness. It becomes very comfortable there. This little dialogue presents us with Penumbra, the student and shadow, the master, accomplished in the art of stepping out of his own way. Penumbra has some illusory light around his edges he still thinks he can control what happens. He equates the loss of control with the loss of power. He's projecting onto Shadow what utter powerlessness must feel like. That would depress anyone. Shadow, for his part, is entirely at the disposal of the intelligence that runs the universe. This makes him a very satisfied fellow. For him, trust is a non-issue. It's peripheral, involuntary, a side effect and fringe benefit of insight. He's the man in the moon, the mirror image, just waiting for reality's eyes to blink or its left hand to touch the tip of its nose. Shadow will blink or touch his nose instantaneously. Fascinating. What will it come up with next? Don't chase after people's approval. Don't depend on your plans. Don't make decisions, let decisions make themselves. Free yourself of concepts, don't believe what you think. Embody the inexhaustible. Wander beyond all paths. Receive what you have been given and know that it is always enough. The master's mind is like a mirror it responds but doesn't store, contains nothing, excludes nothing, and reflects things exactly as they are. Thus she has what she wants and wants only what she has. This is a chapter of good advice. You could do a lot worse than follow it. But all advice is dispensable. Here's what I mean. It's morning again. You open your eyes. There's a you. There's a world. There's even a woman lying in bed beside you, 
the radiant one, whom you fell in love with the very first moment. The gratitude you feel is one drop in the vast ocean of gratitude that surrounds you. It's unnecessary to feel more than that single drop. There's a musician at the foot of the bed. His hands look like oak leaves. He is leaning back with his arms raised in a gesture of what might seem if you didn't know any better like despair. A skull sits on your nightstand, giving you its long in the tooth, memento mori grin. Flowers drift through the air in Brownian motion. Inevitably, there's a guitar in your hands. You don't you know how to play, but you're a fast learner. It must be time for a la tristesse du rare why, or amour. La vida es sueno, your fingers touch the strings. Already you're moved to tears. Now the sun taps at your window. Your bladder needs emptying. The children have dissolved into peals of laughter. And as your feet touch the floor, yet again the spirit of life and death has not a word to say. Do you see things exactly as they are? How would you know? Yet things are so good that they couldn't get much better. All that you ever wanted is here, right in front of you all that you ever wanted is instantly, irrecoverably, gone. 29. A. Without the concept of an other, there is no separate I. Without the sense of an I, nothing can be seen as other. There is some power that determines things, but I don't know what it is. It has no form or substance, acts without doing. Keeps the whole universe in order, and seems to get along perfectly well without me. In the mind spectrum of awareness, solipsism and paranoia are located at about the same point. There's not much difference between an inflated I and an inflated other. Wisdom means no separation. It's easy to keep things at a distance. It's hard to be naturally beyond them. The more intimate you are with yourself, the less anyone can be another. The power that determines things isn't me, but it isn't anything else. Realizing this is freedom. It has nothing to do with the credos of religion. Those hundred-piece um pa pa bands meant to drown out the sound of doubt. What keeps the whole universe in order speaks with the still small voice of silence. Only the don't know mind can hear it. 30. The master accepts his situation and doesn't want anything else. If he finds himself rich and honored, he acts as a rich man should act if he is poor and neglected. He acts as a poor man should act in difficulty. He acts as someone in difficulty should act. Life can present him with no situation in which he isn't master of himself. When he has a high position, he doesn't bully his subordinates. When he has a low position, he doesn't fawn on his superiors. He takes responsibility for himself and seeks nothing from other people, so he is never disappointed. Thus the master lives in perfect serenity, arms open to whatever life brings him, whereas the unaware person walks on the edge of danger, continually trying to keep one step ahead of his fate. The master lives a life of appropriate action, because he doesn't believe his own thoughts, there is no barrier between his mind and reality. If he knows to do something, he does it. If he knows not to, he doesn't. Ethics, for him, is so intimate that it has ceased to be a consideration. His peace is as far from the certainty of the arrogant man as from the inner struggle of the good man who doesn't have a clue. Living in serenity means being open to whatever life brings. When the master looks forward, there are infinite possibilities. When he looks back, there is only one. What happened is always the best thing that could have happened, because it's the thing that did happen. This is not some Pangloshian airy-fairy theory, theory, wishful thinking raised to the nth degree. It's Spinoza's intellectual love of God rock solid, incontrovertible, lived. 31. Chuang Tzu and Huey Tzu were playing checkers. You say that you're an ordinary person, Huey Tzu said. If you're so ordinary, how can you be so happy? Chuang Tzu said, I'm just like anyone else, except that I don't have feelings like anger, fear, or sadness. Since I don't suffer, good and bad can't affect me. Hui Tzu said, Can someone really not suffer? Chuang Tzu said, Of course. When you understand the mind, you're no longer attached to likes and dislikes, so they can't do you any harm. You just follow reality and don't try to control. It's as simple as that. Hui Tzu said, but if you don't suffer at all, how can you be human? Chuang Tzu said, is happiness inhuman? Where does suffering come from? Can it exist outside the mind? Hui Tzu said, but it's unnatural to be happy all the time. 
Anger and sadness are a part of life. We let go of them as best we can. Chuang Tzu said, You have an awfully strange view of the natural. The natural is the spontaneous, the free. When we're clear, anger and sadness can't arise. If you spent less time thinking and more time investigating your mind, you'd stop talking nonsense. How can you let go of what's not there to begin with? The ancient Chinese form of checkers was a wickedly complicated game. When the two friends played, Xuan Tzu always won, because he had more than logic at his disposal. He could not only see straight ahead, he could see around corners. This gave him a distinct advantage. Their dialogues were a form of checkers as well. Here the subject is suffering. Hui Tzu believes that anger, fear and sadness are a necessary part of life, that they spring up out of nowhere, inevitable, uncaused. But every painful feeling is caused by a prior thought. We can't understand the why of the thoughts arising, but we can learn the how of undoing it, and with it, our suffering. Then we don't need to bother about the why. The constant happiness that Chuang Tzu talks about may seem to be an ideal, but in fact he is the realist here. The only thing that can interrupt happiness is an untrue thought. It's like a cloud hiding the sun. When we investigate it, it dissolves. Wisdom is the art of cloudlessness. Reality gives us a body, thrusts us into the thick of life and its changing passions, eases us with old age, and with death returns us to peace. And if our life is a good thing, our death is a good thing too. Having a body isn't a problem, unless you think that you are your body. What's the dividing line between inside and outside? The skin? Hate him. When good has no opposite, the mind can't contract into its judgments, and each moment stands by itself, lucid and undeniable. How could death be anything but good, except as the result of a thought? And who would be there to think it? Though the Tao is the realest of the real, it has no form or substance. It can be pointed to but not seen, embodied but not achieved. It is its own source, its own root. It is above all things, yet it isn't lofty beneath all things, yet it isn't low. It existed before existence, began before time began, and gave birth to birth and death. Thus the Master isn't fooled by appearances. He honors the genuine, wherever it appears. We can call it God or Buddha nature, we can call it the mystery at the heart of all things, or the love that moves the sun and the other stars, or the vital, imminent, subtle, radiant X. We can get more and more refined, meticulous or ecstatic, and still it will slip through our language like water through a net. The short version is the Tao, each thing in the universe seen in itself, each thing is the universe, unique beyond conception. The less we cling to one side of reality betting on either or or, arguing for, for, or against the more we can be aware of the exquisite counterpoint of things. Everything matters how we vote, how we tie our shoelaces, how we respond to the faintest whisper of a thought. And nothing matters. Because look, it's already gone. When we understand this, we're home free. The master lives in the center, the immature live on the edge of things, unsatisfied, always reaching for what is not. The master lives in harmony, the immature pick and choose, accept some things and reject some, and make themselves miserable trying to control the world. When things seem to be in discord, return to the center. The master lives in the center of the universe, which turned out to be the center of himself. He discovered that there's nothing to it, no self, no other. Amazing. Wherever you go, there you aren't. The immature live in the center too. It's just that they're not aware of it yet. They put their thoughts between themselves and the center, and presto, they're outside, teetering on the edge of things, looking for love in all the wrong places, trading life and liberty for the pursuit of a happiness that scampers off as soon as it's pursued. A pity. Actually, it's not a pity, it's a path. Discord becomes opportunity. The center is always less than a thought away. Du Quan was reading a book at the upper end of the hall. Pian the wheelwright was making a wheel at the lower end. Putting down his mallet and chisel, he walked over and said, May I be so bold as to ask what your grace is reading? The words of the sages, said the duke. Are these sages still alive? No, they're long dead. Then what you're reading is just the dregs they left behind. 
How dare you make such a comment on what I am reading, the Duke shouted. Explain yourself, or you die. Certainly, your grace, said the wheelwright. Here's how I see it. When I work on a wheel, if I hit the chisel too softly, it slides and won't grip. But if I hit it too hard, it gets stuck in the wood. When the stroke is neither too soft nor too hard, I know it. My hands can feel it. There's no way I can describe this place of perfect balance. No one taught it to me, and I can't teach it to my son. I have been practicing my craft for seventy years now, and I will never be able to pass it on. When the old sages died, they took their understanding with them. That's why I said that what you're reading is just the dregs they left behind. I don't know who your wheelwright is, but these ancient Chinese noblemen had some remarkable folks working for them. Take the ferocious Duke Huan. He was known far and wide for his combustible temper. Drawing a sword was as natural for him as drawing a breath. So you might think that his servants tiptoed around him with their hearts in their throats. Not in the least. Pian didn't stand on ceremony or wait to be spoken to. He could, after all, have kept on minding his own business, but something in the Duke's demeanor called him to intervene. Like a fool, he rushed in where? In Confucian angels feared to tread. Sometimes you just can't leave well enough alone. The Duke was trying to find the place of perfect balance by reading other people's descriptions. It can't be done. Pian's statement felt like a slap in the face because the Duke was still taking things personally. When honor other people's opinions is your bread and butter, an insult is a matter of life and death. Fortunately for us, Pien considered life and death to be insignificant matters. Having uncoiled the tightrope of the Duke's anger, Pien proceeded to walk it like an acrobat. This boldness was simply trust in his own experience. He was a man in his eighties, and he knew that what is most valuable can't be taught. It can only be learned. Marvelously, the story is left open-ended. Pien may well have survived. Maybe the Duke nodded in acknowledgement. Maybe he even cried out bravo. From the words of this wheelwright I have learned how to live my life, but if he shouted off with his head and the sword leapt from its scabbard, Pien would have offered himself without batting an eyelash. Win some, lose some. He was a man fully dedicated to his craft and to the freedom of his perhaps unappreciative sovereign. 36. Whatever happens or doesn't happen, can you center yourself in the Tao? Can you stop looking to others and focus on your innermost self? Can you return to the beginning of the world and be like a newborn baby? It can scream its head off all day, yet it never becomes hoarse. It can clench its fist for hours, yet its fingers never get cramped. It can stare all day without blinking, yet its eyes never grow tired. Free from concerns and worries, unaware of itself, it moves without thinking doesn't know why things happen, doesn't need to know. To act without needing a reason, to sit still without knowing how, to ride the current of what is this is the primal virtue. People think that entering the kingdom of heaven has something to do with good and evil, but as Jesus implied, every mother's child wakes up in the kingdom of heaven. Heaven is intimacy the world before separation. It looks exactly like earth but without the thoughts that branch out in a thousand directions too heavy for us to bear. Our first parents were not the good children in a morality tale. They were enchanted with each other and with themselves, Adam staring into the mirror of phenomena, Eve singing as she plaited a wreath. The tree they ate from was not called the tree of evil, it was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They became mere grown-ups the moment they bit into that bitter fruit. They opened their eyes and thought that they knew something. They heard the voice of guilt and punishment walking in the garden in the cool of the day. They imagined that they were naked, when all the while they were clad in all earthly abundance and crowned with the moon and stars. 37. Though the master does nothing, her not doing is the opposite of inaction. Because she acts without effort, each task does itself, in its own time. Her body may move or not move, but her mind is always at ease. Still water is like a mirror. When you look into it, you can see the very hairs on your eyebrows. It lies so horizontal that carpenters use it as a measure. If water is so clear, so level, how much more so the master's mind. All things are reflected in it as they are without distortion. It is like the Tao, open, serene, unmoving, 
the mirror of heaven and earth. The master does what everyone else does gets up, brushes her teeth, but she isn't stuck in the thought that she's doing it. This makes her life very simple, tic-tac-toe. Her mind is always at ease because she doesn't believe that reality should be different than it is right now. She's the field of awareness, the fulcrum of the possible. She's the placeholder, the space giver, the word on the tip of your tongue. When you read between the lines, it's her that you're reading. She's the mirror and the mirrored, the pond and the servant kneeling, the truth teller, the self-knower, the self-knower, the self-delighter, the lover of what is, the one with the wide open heart, the one you can always depend on. She's no one. She's you without a future. She's the you you always wanted to be. 38. Chuang Tzu and Hui Tzu were walking across the bridge over the river Hao. Chuang Tzu said, look at the minnows, swimming and leaping to their heart's content. That's what makes fish happy. Hui Tzu said, you're not a fish, so how do you know what makes fish happy? Chuang Tzu said, you're not me, so how do you know that I don't know what makes fish happy? Hui Tzu said, true, I'm not you, so I certainly have no idea what you know. On the other hand, you're certainly not a fish, and that just proves that you can't know what makes fish happy. Chuang Tzu said, let's go back to your original question. You said, how do you know what makes fish happy so when you asked the question, you knew that I knew it. I know it by standing here over the river Hao. Chuang Tzu and Hui Tzu, old pals and sparring partners, are at it again. Crossing the river, Hui Tzu stirs things up from a less than radical not knowing. Logically, he has the better case. But the conversation isn't about knowing. Chuang Tzu would be the first to concede that he can't know anything the real topic is freedom. If what you hear is two men arguing about who's right, you've missed the point. An apocryphal sage named Einstein, who could easily have been photographed in an ebullient mood, with his tongue out said, there is only one important question, is the universe friendly, here's another way of putting it, when the mind is happy, the universe is happy. Does the universe seem unfriendly or neutral? It's only because you're seeing it that way. As Chuan Tzu watches the minnow swimming and leaping, his heart leaps too. Naturally, he projects his own joy onto them. He's happy for them, as them. And who's to say that this is not an accurate view of reality? For all we know, the whole universe is alive and pulsing with joy, joy pulsing from every minnow, every molecule, from every creature on earth, from fire, hail, snow and frost, mountains and barren hills, fruit trees and cedar forests, wild animals and tame, reptiles, insects and birds. Joy to the world, all the boys and girls, joy to the fishes in the deep blue sea, joy to you and me. 39. The master lets go of desire and people are fulfilled, he has no goal in mind, and people are transformed, he remains silent, and people are educated. Act without doing, speak without intention, and even the beggars in the street will benefit from your example. The master doesn't interfere. He perfects the whole world in his heart. He leaves the gold hidden in the mountains and the pearl at the bottom of the sea. He has no interest in wealth or fame, sees no advantage in long life, isn't elated by success, isn't discouraged by failure, or confused by the world's rights and wrongs. He knows that all beings are strung on a single thread and that life and death are one body. The master's job couldn't be cushier. All he does is be, and he doesn't even do that. There's nothing required of him. He doesn't help, doesn't lead, doesn't set an example. He just observes the marvelous transformations of mind. When we live or work with him, we are inspired by his very presence, by the spaciousness of it. Finally, someone who is at home in the world, who's utterly responsible and carefree. We didn't know it was possible to be happy all the time. We didn't know you could have a heart without any checkpoints. The master doesn't interfere in other people's lives. Why would he? He knows that he doesn't know what's best for the world, or even for himself. He leaves the gold hidden in the mountains, because he doesn't need it on his wrist or around his wife's neck or in the bank. Yes, he could buy pickaxes and hire ten villages of dwarfs, but he realizes that when you extract gold, there's always an irritated dragon to deal with. Besides, entrepreneurship is less exciting than the adventure of discovering what is enough. How fine life becomes when what you want is exactly what you have. 40. Are you worried about the world? 
Do you think that it needs your guidance? Don't the heavens turn by themselves? Don't sun and moon find their places? What masterminds all this? What creates all the connections? What, without any effort, makes everything happen in its time? Is there some hidden mechanism that makes life be as it is? Do things just happen to turn out exactly the way they do? Do clouds make the rain, or is it rain that makes up the clouds? What force puffs them and punctures them? The winds rise in the north, they blow now west, now east, and wander across the heavens. What, without any effort, stirs up this unfathomable joy? Some people have an atlas complex they carry the world on their shoulders. They believe that if they put the world down, it couldn't carry on by itself. Worry and fear, they think, are the motivators for right action. If they saw the world as perfect, they think they would be complacent and passive they would just stay at home and cultivate their own gardens. But what if cultivating your own garden were the best way to help the world? What if your little backyard could, with the proper care, grow enough vegetables and fruits to feed a million people? What if your gardening inspired a thousand of your neighbors to do the same? But a backyard can't feed a million people dot dash dash ah, my dear fellow, it's a metaphor. I'm not talking about physical food or even necessarily physical people. Worrying about the world is a dead end. When nuclear proliferation is solved, global warming pops up. When global warming is solved, overpopulation starts looming. Then there's always the burning out of the sun and the infinite expansion or contraction of the universe, which leaves us at zero any way you slice it. When the mind discovers what it is, we wake up from these mortal dramas as if from a dream. All possible disasters have already happened, and if a future appears, we thread it through the eye of the needle. And whether we act or don't act, voila miraculously, without exception, things turn out exactly the way they do. 41. In the beginning, there was nothing. From nothing arose the One. All things return to it. Because it is without form, there is no way to name it. It doesn't exist and does not exist. When we call it the Tao, we define nothing as a something. The Tao is beyond words. The more you talk about it, the farther away from it you get. Only when you are truly unattached to words or to silence can you express the truth. Ah, the Tao. The Tao. When we talk about it, the vast isn't vast enough, and the subtle seems ludicrously crude. The only way to approach it is through paradox to step out of the way until language bites its own tail. And a little chutzpah doesn't hurt. Chutzpah is usually defined as effrontery, but it's more than that. It's effrontery with a feather in its cap. It's the sound of three hands clapping. It's a garlic bagel crashing a party of champagne flutes. It's not a good thing or a bad thing, but we tend to smile or gasp when we encounter it. Though there's no Chinese ideogram for chutzpah, this chapter is a perfect case study. So if the more we talk about the Tao, the farther away from it we get, why would we talk about it at all? But okay, let's talk. We begin with the beginning, which equals zero, a nice round number that is the absence of numbers. From this absence, the one arises. Are you reeling yet? But there's more. If zero transmutes into one, zero equals one. So much for the foundations of mathematics then, from the one, after a fraction of a nanoinstant, with a bang, the infinitely many arise. Ultimately, infinity returns to the one, which equals zero. But the one doesn't not exist. It doesn't exist either you can't limit it to either category of mind. So when we say, all things are one, we're lying through our teeth. Since reality is beyond conception, how can we dare to talk about it? But we do. And there's something endearing about the daring of that. If nothing else, it makes us think. Even better, it makes us not think, which could be the point of it all. 42. As Chuang Tzu was fishing in the river Piyu, two high officials arrived from the king of Xiyu and said, Sir, the king requests that you come to the capital and serve as his prime minister. Without turning his head, Chuang Tzu answered, I have heard that in Chiyu there is a sacred tortoise that died 3,000 years ago. The king keeps its shell in the temple, wrapped in silk and encased in a golden box. Now, if you were this tortoise, would you prefer to be venerated in such a way? Or would you rather be alive again, crawling around in the mud the latter? Certainly said the officials. 
Sichuan Tzu said, Give my compliments to His Majesty and tell him that I am happy right here, crawling around in the mud. This story features Quang Tzu as Huckleberry Finn. All he needs for perfect contentment is a fishing pole and some bait. It's easy to decline power when you don't care what people think of you and you've unraveled the urge to control. There's nothing more delicious than having no future. The king of Aishu was a little slow on the uptake because he didn't understand how useful it is to be useless. The job of prime minister was the pinnacle of success for a commoner, the worldly man's daydream. It was also a royal pain in the neck, long hours, stupefying details, dangerous boss, ungrateful public. Having delivered the king's request, the officials waited politely. They were wise men and knew that fishing is not about catching fish. Chuan Tuzu didn't bow. He didn't rise to face them. His behavior could have been considered the height of rudeness. But integrity is always beautiful to the discerning eye. His focus was on the fishing pole. He never even stopped to wonder about the consequences of a refusal. In the end, the officials returned to Xiu not empty-handed. What they respectfully carried back was Chuang Tizu's response, which was, in their eyes, an honor to the king. It was also an honor to the sacred tortoise, brought back to muddy life now after 3,000 years. 43. Give up wanting to be important, let your footsteps leave no trace. Travel alone as the Tao to the land of the Great Silence. If a man is crossing a river and an empty boat collides with his own boat, he won't get offended or angry however hot-tempered he may be. But if the boat is manned, he may flare up, shouting and cursing, just because there's a rower. Realize that all boats are empty as you cross the river of the world, and nothing can possibly offend you. When you understand how utterly alone you are, it's a cause for celebration. Break out the caviar and champagne. Le Roy est mort, vive le Roy. If everyone is your projection in the first place, if you see not them but who you think they are, how can you be offended? Seen a river. You're drifting along in your little boat, happy as a minnow, and suddenly some jerk bangs into you, full force. But when you look, it's an empty boat. Since there's no offender, naturally there's no offense. Dot dash dash, you mean that the woman who broke my heart or my backstabbing colleague, or the politicians who got us into this mess. They're all empty boats. Yes, indeed. This has nothing to do with taking the right action against greed or stupidity. But if you're offended, it means that you're not paying attention. 44. Chaff from the winnowing fan cancels the eye's natural vision. The whine of a mosquito can keep you awake all night. Trying to be benevolent makes the mind a tangle of confusion. If you want the world to stay simple, you must move with the freedom of the wind. Why keep making the effort to figure out right and wrong? Why all this huffing and puffing as though you were beating a drum, searching for a lost child? The snow goose doesn't need a daily bath to stay white, nor does the crow stay black by dipping itself in an inkwell. When the springs dry up and the fish are left on the shore, they spew one another with moisture. But how much better if they could forget one another and swim off into the lake's vast freedom? The effort to be moral or benevolent is a disruption of our natural virtue. What child would rather pray than play? Throw away morality, Lao Tzu says, and you'll be doing the world a big favor trying to figure out the right action does no one any good. It's better to keep moving till the right action arises by itself. When it's genuine, benevolence is the most beautiful quality in the world. But when it has a motive, it feels like fish spittle, not like clear water. We recognize the genuine. It's what we all want. It's what we all are when we see past our own thoughts. Let the others comfort one another with slime that's the best they can do under the circumstances. But the instant any fish finds its way back to the lake, it will swim off without a qualm. Thanks for the benevolence, muchachos, but I'm out of here. 45. Everything, seen in itself, is both good and bad, right and wrong, useful and useless, appropriate and inappropriate, possible and beyond possibility. A battering ram can break down a city wall, but it can't patch a hole in the ceiling. Fine horses can travel a hundred miles in a day, but they can't catch mice as a weasel can. The owl can spot a flea in the dark, but in broad daylight, however hard it may stare, it can't even see a mountain. If you want to have right without wrong or order without disorder, you don't understand the Tao. You can't have one quality and not have its opposite as well. 
you can't reach for the positive and not create the negative by the very act of your reaching. The master stands beyond opposites. She doesn't move toward or away. She sees things exactly as they are. In itself, everything is free of qualities, but when it appears to you or me, it absorbs qualities from the mind as a color absorbs light. The tree that moves some to tears of joy is, for others, only a green thing that stands in the way. As we see it, so it is. Once you realize that for every thought you believe, the opposite is equally true, there's no way you can get stuck. Give me a place to stand on, Archimedes said, and I will move the earth. How can you make the world right if you're standing in the midst of right and wrong? Having vowed to overcome entropy, you create order at point A, and immediately point B collapses into chaos. You reach out toward the shadowless, and the closer your hand gets, the closer your shadow gets, too. The master understands that in the moral universe, as in the physical, the observed depends on the observer. This leaves her with no place to stand. From this no place, she can move the whole universe. 46. Chiing, the master woodworker, carved a bell stand so intricately graceful that all who saw it were astonished. They thought that a god must have made it. The Marquis of Lu asked, How did your art achieve something of such unearthly beauty? My lord. Ching said, I'm just a simple woodworker, I don't know anything about art. But here's what I can tell you. Whenever I begin to carve a bell stand, I concentrate my mind. After three days of meditating, I no longer have any thoughts of praise or blame. After five days, I no longer have any thoughts of success or failure. After seven days, I'm not identified with a body. All my power is focused on my task, there are no distractions. At that point, I enter the mountain forest. I examine the trees until exactly the right one appears. If I can see a bell stand inside it, the real work is done, and all I have to do is get started. Thus I harmonize inner and outer. That's why people think that my work must be superhuman. When people saw H. Ng's bell stand, they were astonished to get a glimpse of who we are. Always the natural reaction to genius a recognition, an unforeseen depth. Explanations are secondary. People thought that a god must have made the bell stand only because they imagined a limit to the human mind. Like Duke Huan's wheelwright and Prince Wen Hui's cook, Qiang had learned to follow the Tao, which goes beyond all art. Without the distraction of past or future, his mind was free, moment by moment, to move toward its own delight. Concentration, he found, was not a matter of applying effort, it was a way of eliminating the unnecessary. After a while, concepts such as good and evil, success and failure, flitted off into the unreal like ghosts that have lost their mission. What remained was the silence, a deep, slow, flowing river in which he stood up to his hips, attentive to every ripple and splash, knowing that there was a hidden life beneath the surface, and that if only he was patient enough, it would yield itself to him in its time. Nothing happened for days, and again nothing, and more nothing, and he was unaware of how tenuous the separation between him and the world had become. By the time he entered the forest, he was a tree among trees. Coming upon the right one was like seeing himself in a mirror. Suddenly it was there he was there, and the bell stand fully articulated within him. From that point on, he knew he would never die. 47. You can't talk about the ocean with a frog who lives in a well he is bounded by the space he inhabits. You can't talk about ice with an insect who was born in June he is bounded by a single season. You can't talk about the Tao with a person who thinks he knows something he is bounded by his own beliefs. The Tao is vast and fathomless. You can understand only by stepping beyond the limits of yourself. You can talk about the ocean with a frog who lives in a well, but the conversation will be rather one-sided. Eventually you realize that the only reason you've been talking is that you love the sound of your own voice. Let me tell you about the ocean. It's vast. It's deep. Ha! Ah. You can sail across it for days, for weeks, and never come to the end. Yeah, right. It contains trillions of quadrillions of living creatures, from the microscopic to the gargantuan. I have a few lily pads here. Flies and mosquitoes. The ocean is so deep that fish living far down generate their own light.
What do you mean by fish? 48. Let go of all your assumptions and the world will make perfect sense. In movement, be fluid as water at rest, be bright as a mirror in response, be simple as an echo, keep your mind serene, like the still surface of a lake, clear-eyed and imperturbable. Walk through life as though you didn't exist. When nothing is left to argue with and there is nothing to oppose, you will find yourself at peace and in harmony with all things. Our assumptions about the world become our world. Confusion projects confusion, and we wonder why life doesn't make sense. Why do the wicked prosper that's easy because they do? If this answer seems flippant, you might take a closer look at wicked and prosper. There are assumptions in each word that can put you in a padded cell or inspire you to exterminate your neighbors. But if assumptions are questioned deeply enough, they let go of themselves. The world becomes intelligible, kind, and problem-free because the mind has become clear. Your you is no longer a something, it's fluid, permeable, bright, it winks in and out of existence like a quark. When you find nothing to oppose, there's nothing that can oppose you. 49. Chie Sing Tsu was training a gamecock for the king. After ten days, the king asked if the bird was ready for combat. No, your majesty said Chi. He's arrogant, always ready to pick a fight. He's still relying on his own strength. Another ten days passed, and the king asked again. Chi said, no, sire, not yet. He still becomes excited when a rival bird appears. Ten more days. The king asked again. Not yet, Chi said. He still gets an angry glint in his eye. Another ten days. Another question. Chi said, now, sire, he's almost ready. When a rival crows, he doesn't react. He stands motionless like a block of wood. His focus is inside. Other birds will take one look at him and run. Yes, yes, I know that blood sports are immoral. But just for a moment, let's posit a world in which they're not only moral but heroic. If, in that world, you were a trainer of gamecocks, wouldn't you want to do your job without a scruple? What for someone else would be animal abuse would for you be the training of the supreme athlete, the ultimate competitor. Rather than lounging around the barnyard and ending up roasted on a platter for a merchant's Sunday dinner, your birds would be rigorously cared for, brought to the peak of fitness, given a life of privilege and abundance punctuated by a few violent, satisfying murders. For the weaker ones, the end would be quick. Instead of a butcher's knife, an adrenaline rush, and the flash of a rival's spur, Chi A. Cheng Su was an expert. He was in the business of turning ordinary roosters into feathered samurai. This took an austere hand, a keen eye, and a spiritual discernment that even a master might admire. There was no barrier between trainer and trained. Since he didn't rely on his own strength, he could easily spot arrogance in others. Since his own heart was calm, he could sense when the slightest agitation arose in his birds. What other trainers might miss the too confident strut? the glint of impatience or anger his awareness was quick to pounce on. The point was to step into the ring indifferent to life and death, with no desire for success or fear of failure. Entirely concentrated, the graduate of Chi's training walked forward sensing neither self nor other. The lesser champions fought and won. The great champions didn't have to fight, they were masters of the art of peace, and their opponents could find nowhere to penetrate. In the face of such magnificence, discretion was the better part of valor. The mature person is like a good archer. When he misses the bull's eye, he turns around and seeks the reason for his failure in himself. When you can live this most radical simile, missing the bull's eye may look like a flash of irritation with your wife or outrage at the morning's headlines. Turning around means taking total responsibility. There's no blame or denial in it. Unchain yourself from achievement and enjoy an ordinary life. Flow like the Tao, unhindered, unnoticed, unnamed, with no goals, no expectations. Be like a child, like a fool, though that there is nothing to know. This is the direct way to freedom. Only because our perspective is so limited do we think we can achieve something that lasts. To a more expansive mind, a billion years are but as yesterday. Eternity laughs at the productions of time. In the Bardo realm, seeing the lone and level sands under which his mighty works lay buried, Ozymandias decided that the next time around, he would be a shoemaker in the Bronx. Achievements, 
and attainments are just stories of a future or a past. Right now in this moment, there is there can be nothing but the ordinary a man sitting at the kitchen table with a cup of lukewarm coffee in front of him. Not much to achieve there. The day unfolds its little surprises. You flow from concentration to relaxedness to concentration, from morning to evening, and the only possible break in the current of delight is an untrue thought. Everyday mind is the Tao. The duck's legs are short, you can't lengthen them without making her suffer. The crane's legs are long, you can't shorten them without causing him pain. What is long needs no cutting off, what is short needs no stretching. When you realize this, you can let the world go its own way. Do you think that you know what's best? Do you think that the world should conform to your way of thinking? All these benevolent people, how much worrying they do. Since ancient times, what a lot of fuss and upheaval the benefactors of humanity have caused. We don't usually imagine benevolent people as wreaking havoc right and left. And yet, if you contemplate this chapter, you may come to see a world in which ducks are stretched out on the rack with nothing to confess but their shortness, and amputee cranes line the highways on crutches, each with a tin cup, begging for alms. This may be a world closer than you think. It may be your life. Even with the kindest of intentions, you can't try to change people without inflicting violence on them and on yourself. Hitler and Stalin, in their own opinions, were acting for the benefit of humanity. They thought that they knew best. Violence was a necessary prelude to utopia. In order to make an omelet, you had to crack a few eggs. This is how the I know mind functions. It's lethal. Whenever I believe that you are too much or not enough, I am caught in a delusion, and I suffer. Those ducks, they're perfect just the way they are. Waddling around on their adorable little legs, and cranes stride through the marsh on legs not a millimeter too long. There may be a lot that needs fixing, but there's nothing out there to fix. As he was eating by the side of the road, Lai Tzu saw an old skull. He pulled it out of the weeds, contemplated it, and said, only you and I know that there is no such thing as death and no such thing as life. The philosopher Lai Tzu has stopped for lunch on his journey from here to there. He sits down by the side of the road, opens his knapsack, takes out a few rice balls and a piece of dried fish. It's a leisurely meal. He has nowhere in particular to go. Suddenly he notices an old skull. He pulls it out of the weeds for a teti a -te. He has no ideas about whoever used to inhabit it, no pity, no urge to do an alas. Poor Yorick the skull is his colleague. It may look a bit hollow but it knows exactly what he knows. You too, Laiatsu says, have no mind to contend with. You don't tell yourself lies about pain multiplied beyond one body. You realize that death is a noun without a plural. Only one person ever dies. If that says the skull, a master of understatement. The Book of Songs says, the hawk soars to the heavens, the fish plunges to the depths. This means that there is no place where the Tao doesn't penetrate for the mature person. The Tao begins in the relation between man and woman and ends in the infinite vastness of the universe. The Tao doesn't need to penetrate anywhere. It's already there. There is here you could say that there's nowhere it isn't, and yet there's nowhere it is. But how abstract these concepts of space and time are. Perhaps some Native American language has a single word for that through which all perceptible forms manifest a word as vivid as the green of grass or the smell of an orange. Awareness is what matters. If the awareness that the universe is intelligent doesn't penetrate into my blood, my bones, I might as well not have it. The mature person is the student of the mind, the one who understands that reality happens from the inside out. What are we projecting? The relation between man and woman is the clearest mirror. When we get that right, we get everything right. Life is the companion of death, death is the beginning of life. Who can understand how the two are related? But if life and death are companions, why should you be concerned? All things are connected at the root. We arrive here from the unknown and go back to where we came from. What people love about life is its miraculous beauty. What they hate about death is the loss and decay around it. Yet losing is not losing and decay turns into beauty as beauty turns back into decay. We are breathed in, breathed out. Therefore, all you need is to understand the one breath that makes up the world. 
the master is always conscious of the mystery at the heart of all things. After the joyful, raucous skepticism of the earlier chapters, a bucket full of ice water poured onto you while you're still snoozing under the comforter this chapter's mode of unknowing is a grandmotherly kindness. Life becomes very gentle when you understand that you're not living it. The ancient masters looked ordinary, but their wisdom was profound. They didn't deviate from the truth. The clever couldn't persuade them, the beautiful couldn't seduce them, the rich couldn't corrupt them. They considered life and death to be insignificant matters. Unhindered, their minds could soar to the edges of the unknown, beyond time and space, and plunge past the beginning and the end. They could take the most menial positions and find contentment in their work. Their virtue filled earth and heaven. The more they gave to themselves, the more they could give to others. The more they gave to others, the more they had for themselves. You never knew when you'd bump into one of them. You might be in a public toilet, and there he was, scrubbing the floor, humming to himself with a little smile. Or you'd be buying a piece of salmon at the market, and the fat old woman behind the counter would ask an ungraspable question that would resonate inside you for days. Or you'd sit down next to a beggar on the street, one of the lost apparently, his wrinkles caked with grime, and when he looked into your eyes, you'd feel penetrated to the core. The ancient masters had no word for compassion. They wouldn't have understood it, because they didn't harbor concepts of self and other generosity for them was like breathing. When they gave, it was for no reason to no one. They didn't expect a grateful response, or any response at all. It was always themselves they were giving to. Once, when a seabird landed outside the capital, the Marquis of Lou escorted it to his ancestral temple, had the music of the ninefold splendors performed, poured out a cup of old wine, and spread before it a feast of beef and pork. But the bird became dazed, and it pined away, refusing to taste meat or wine. In three days it was dead. This was treating the bird as the Marquis would have liked to be treated, not as the bird would have liked to be treated. Had he done so, he would have let it roost in the deep forests, play among the islands, swim in the rivers and lakes, feed on mudfish and minnows, fly with the rest of the flock, and live any way it chose to. The capital of Lou must have been seriously landlocked if this sea bird and albatross perhaps seemed so exotic. The bird was a sensible creature, and the last thing it wanted was celebrity. The Marquis, a famous epicure and an obtusely empathetic fellow, proceeded to kill it with kindness. He chose the best of everything, but the bird was not impressed by the ancient Chinese equivalents of a 1947 Cheval Blanc, a three-star Michelin meal, and the Goldberg variations. It died pining for its freedom and a couple of fresh fish. The Marquis was not the only person in history who, by acting out the golden rule, became the golden fool. Was he repentant afterward? Did he start buttonholing wedding guests and holding them with his glittering eye? In any case, the extravagance of his selfishness removes him from history and inserts him into parable. Any child can tell you that hay is for horses, milk is for cats, and fish is for albatrosses, and that we should let wild animals live any way they choose to. Love your neighbor as yourself leave him alone. If you center yourself in non-being, your mind becomes one. If your mind has become one, there is no opening in you through which harm can enter. When a drunk falls from a wagon, he won't be killed, no matter how fast the wagon is moving. His body is like other men's, but the way he falls is different. Life and death mean nothing to him, thus fear can't enter his heart. He meets all circumstances like an infant, without a thought. Unconscious that he is falling, he falls softly, and his bones bend like the branches of a tree. If there is such safety in wine, how much more in wisdom? Drunks can teach us a lot. For example, that the road of excess leads to the forest of confusion, or that without the thought of a future we always fall softly. That's a good thing to know. Life is an ongoing course in learning how to fall. The falling is inevitable, the harm is optional. As you simplify your mind, you will see how simple life is. As you learn not knowing, your heart will find its way home. Content as a suckling infant, mindless as a newborn calf, you will no longer exhaust yourself looking for impossible answers and wandering in search of why. You will come to rest in the Tao, happy with what life brings you. Given a choice between being Einstein and being a newborn calf, most people would choose the former. 
But this chapter is not about stupidity versus intelligence. There's a great deal of intelligence in the mindlessness of a newborn calf, which is further along in its self-reliance than a newborn baby, even a baby Einstein. The calf, in fact, knows everything it needs to know. All the important questions are answered for it, forever. Simplify, simplify our friend Thoreau said. He could simply have said, simplify since a word to the wise is sufficient. But for our unwisdom, he raised the decibel level. He may even have had to shout at Einstein, who was a master of simplicity, though not of simplifying his own life. All honor to him, and yet he would have given his eye teeth to understand the mind of God, which every newborn calf or suckling infant can manage. A theory of everything. What is is? How simple can it get? There is nothing more perfect than the Tao, yet it doesn't seek perfection. When you understand perfection, you realize that there is nothing to seek, nothing to gain or lose, nothing to defend or reject. You return to yourself and find what is inexhaustible. For most of us, perfection is an idea of what should be. Comparing what is to our idea of what should be, we judge what is as deficient. But once we get a little sanity going and can tell the difference between reality and our thoughts about it, the habit of comparison subsides and perfection becomes not abstract but lived. In the first flush of understanding, we may feel drunk with the good news, we may have to pinch ourselves, we may start babbling the obvious. In the words of the ancient poet, this is perfect. That is perfect. Perfect. Perfect comes from perfect. Take perfect from perfect. The remainder is perfect. To the unattainable how close it is. No need to understand it or accept it. No need to look anywhere else or to look for it at all. How can it be lost if it was ours from the very beginning? How can it be found if it was never lost? Chuang Tzu's wife died. When Huey Tzu came to offer his condolences, he found Chuang Tzu sprawled out on the ground, pounding on a tub and singing. Hui Ti Su said, You loved her all these years you lived with her. You brought up your children and grew old together. Now that she's gone, don't you owe her a few tears or at least silence? But pounding on a tub and singing at the top of your lungs that's a bit much, don't you think? Not at all, Chuang Tzu said. When she died, I mourned as anyone else would. But then I looked back to the root of her being not just before she was born, but before she even had a body, not just before she had a body, but before she had a soul. In the midst of the unfathomable, ever-changing mystery, suddenly, out of nowhere, she had a soul. Then, suddenly, she had a body. Then, suddenly, she was born. Now there has been another transformation, and she's dead. The same process that brought her to birth, in time brought her to death. As naturally as fall turns into winter and spring into summer, now she is lying at peace in her vast room. I realized that if I went around wailing and pounding my chest, it would show that I didn't understand the first thing about reality. So I stopped. Chuang Tzu's wife died at exactly the right time, as do we all. She moved on without the impediment of concern for her husband, knowing that he wouldn't feel a moment's grief for her. This made her very happy. Now, in the period of mourning, Chuang Tzu sits sprawled out on the ground, pounding on a wash tub and singing. He enjoys singing loudly, with gusto. He isn't a great drummer, but he has a certain odd rhythm of his own. The woman he loves has never left nothing of her is missing but the body. How can a merely physical absence affect his joey de vivre? Hui Tizu, as usual, comes onto the scene as the perfect straight man. His is the voice of shock piety, the propriety that holds the corners of the universe. In place with laundry pins. If you don't suffer, he thinks, it means that you don't care. In his reply, Chuang Tzu is the soul of patience. It's amazing what lies come out of his mouth. He speaks as though he had waited for his wife to die in order to understand about death. That would have been to close the barn door after the horse was stolen. Actually, his whole account of gradual discernment is a fairy tale to cushion the shock to his friend's sensibilities. This is called skillful means if he bent over backward any farther, his ears would be touching his ankles. In reality, there was no mourning, no looking back, no realization, no stopping. Chuang Tzu's wife died. He loved her. He was a happy man. 62. In an age when the Tao is followed, no one rewards the talented or pays special attention to the lovely, the virtuous, 
or the wise. Those who govern are simply the highest branches on the tree, and the people wander in freedom, like deer in the woods. They are honest but think nothing of it. They naturally do what is right. They are kind without any conception of kindness, and are trustworthy though they wouldn't know what that means. They keep no records of their good deeds, because good deeds are so common. That is why all their actions have vanished, without a trace. Excellence is its own reward. When we picture a golden age in which everyone has woken up from the dream of ego, we realize that a simple thank you is enough more than enough. But even though, from the standpoint of the excellent, rewards are unneeded, governing well is like being a good parent, no one in the family is left out. As Alice's Dodo says, everybody has won, and all must have prizes. This doesn't mean that we abandon discernment and let in the rule of Kant. How can Salieri's art equal Mozart's, or Rosa Bonheur's, Cezanne's? Genius isn't democratic, a monument to great Jewish hockey players. Once, at a dinner party, Dr. Johnson said that he could recite an entire chapter from Horobo's Natural History of Iceland, Chapter 72, concerning snakes. There are no snakes to be met with throughout the whole island. Yeats wrote about a peasant girl so beautiful that farmers jostled at the fair to get a glimpse of her. There is something awe-inspiring about beauty, as about virtue or wisdom. Yet when you're married to a beautiful woman, it's nothing special she's beautiful in the same way that the grass is green. Not that you don't deeply appreciate her beauty, but it's part of your daily landscape. It's both numinous and familiar, both ho-hum and hallelujah. We read reports of a hero leaping onto the subway tracks to save someone from an oncoming train. A moment before, he couldn't have predicted that. There was no thought involved. It was a not doing. The Tao just took over. And when he tells a reporter, I'm no hero, anyone would have done the same, he could be right. 63. The Book of Songs says, Though the fish sinks to the bottom, it still can clearly be seen. Thus the master examines her innermost self. She notices even the smallest sign of discord and corrects it before it can do any harm. When your mind is transparent to the depths and your words and actions are one, the whole world becomes transparent. The master does more than just notice discord in herself. Since she knows that a feeling of discord can only be caused by a prior thought, she questions the thought. For her, discord is always a momentary imbalance. When it is investigated, it unravels. Thus it can never do any harm. This is not ethics, it's mental hygiene. When the mind is transparent, the heart is transparent. There are no beliefs to keep awareness from shining through. The primal light shines through even the densest matter. As the world becomes transparent, your goodness, and everyone's, is gradually, heart-stirringly revealed. To the transparent eye, there is no place where goodness is not. When a pickpocket sees a saint, he sees only his pockets. When a saint sees a pickpocket, he sees only his innocence. 64. Integrity is our true nature. Arriving at integrity is the work of a lifetime. The person who has integrity does the right thing without trying to, understands the truth without thinking, and naturally embodies the Tao. Integrity is not only the fulfillment of our own being. It is also the quality through which all beings are fulfilled. When we fulfill our own being, we become truly human. When we fulfill all beings, we arrive at true understanding. Humanness and understanding are inherent in our nature, and by means of them we unite the inner and the outer. Thus, when we act with integrity, everything we do is right. Integrity is the bridge to the kingdom, the kiss that wakes the dead princess, the fingers that spin straw into gold. When a person has integrity, she's genuine. You can always trust that her yes is a yes and her no a no. There's no motive behind it, no sweet sticky lure for approval. We love integrity. It feels like home. It's solid. There's no acting out in it, no backtracking, no second guessing. When you act with integrity, everything you do is right because there's no separation between doer and done. Besides, you realize that you're not doing it in the first place. You have let go into the nameless, and it's not even you who have let go. It's not even you who have been let go of.